I'm David Dale, and uh, some of you know or recognize me. I've been a member of the faculty for a long time, uh, and I've been a mentor for Nick for the last few years. And my long-term research interest has been in blood cells, uh, blood cells and particularly white blood cells, and of the five types of white blood cells, the cells we call neutrophils. And if you know a little bit of hematology, you know that neutrophils are the cells that defend our bodies from infections by being the first responders at a site of uh, invasion by almost any type of bacteria or any sort of foreign matter. So they're very critical cells. And uh, the clinical problem that we focus most on in our research over a long time have been uh, not having enough or having the problem of neutropenia. Neutropenia meaning neutrophils or the cells that historically stained a neutral color and penia, the Greek term for few. So neutropenia uh, being a quantitative reduction in the number of circulating neutrophils. And <clears throat> neutrophils are interesting also in another sense biologically because they're probably the most rapidly turning over cells in our body. Now you get one brain and a few brain cells and that's all you ever get. Uh, but for neutrophils, you make a fresh batch, a fresh batch every day. So that for you and I, the uh, healthy people, the cells in your blood uh, are fresh cells today from yesterday. So if you have anything that interrupts production, you'll see a rather abrupt fall. And in that sense, they're much more dynamically turning over than other blood cells or even the cells of the intestinal tract or almost any other tissue. And that makes it interesting and also very dynamic and in a sense for many researchers over the years, of interest to statisticians because there's something you can measure and count, see how it changes. Uh, the, our interest in neutrophils has really taken clinical shape in the study of patients who have various diseases which cause their neutrophil levels to be low for a long time. Some are acquired disorders, many are genetic disorders, and uh, there are a lot of different causes for neutropenia. In fact, it's a confusing area even for expert hematologists. But an area of focus for us have been on patients who have really low counts, who are very susceptible to infections. Um, and among those patients, there are some patients whose counts are always low. But 40 years ago, I became interested in patients whose counts aren't always low, but they cycle. They go up and down with regular periodicity. Uh, more regular than a woman's menstrual cycle and as regular as the heartbeat, but with a cycle or period length that's uh, nearly always 21 days. So the patients behave as if they're making a batch of cells and they quit and they make another batch and quit. And the utilization is in a very uniform way. And in recent years, we've recognized that uh, these disorders, most of the uh, early childhood disorders are genetic and we found some, though not all, of the genes that cause the defect. And we've learned that for one gene, a gene called neutrophil elastase, the most common cause of these disorders, there are patients who have this cycling phenomena and those that don't. And we've learned that those that have the cycling phenomena are at very low risk or no risk of developing leukemia, whereas the other patients are at very high risk, 20 to 30 percent of them develop acute myeloid leukemia. So it becomes relevant, clinically relevant to a doctor or a nurse, but it's also very relevant to patients or families, the risk for their child developing uh, leukemia or how to care for uh, the individual. So in trying to uh, think about ways to study this topic in greater detail, a, a critical piece of information is serial blood counts, and that is having a simple blood count that can be done in almost any doctor's office done but done frequently enough to see if there's a pattern or if there's a cycle. Anyway, um, Nick and I have worked together with their team in an international registry that's sponsored by the NIH for the last few years. And what we've worked on doing is trying to find a, a way to broaden our reach so that doctors, uh, not only locally but around the world, could reach into our website and find information that would help them to see and analyze blood counts. And Nick's going to take it from there. About a year and a half ago, uh, Dr. Dale approached me about um, collaborating, uh, you know, in our free time, but working on something that can help 
um, you know, patients enter their data and get results um, that may inform them whether or not they have a cyclic neutropenia. So, um, but before I jump into the website, which I'm really dying to do, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about how it's built and some of the considerations that uh, had to go into um, building it. So it's a website. Uh, it's got HTML, JavaScript, and CSS to make it colorful and have uh, interactivity. Um, and real quick, so jQuery is um, it's a uh, library for JavaScript, which is what we use to code websites and uh, make it do things. But jQuery allows us to um, really intuitively and really easily interact with elements and parts of the DOM or the things that you see on a website. Um, that uh, saves me and other programmers a lot of time, and I'm fond of it. Um, and a few uh, extra elements that um, we needed for this project, so a Sparkline plugin, and I'll demonstrate that. Um, and if we're displaying quantitative information, we, we need a way to chart it if it's going to be intuitive to people uh, to use. And, and there's a lot of lovely um, charting libraries out there on, on the internet, but uh, I chose uh, high charts for this one. And, um, it's really easy to use out of the box. It's really easy for me to manipulate. Um, and it's uh, best thing of all, it's free if it's a non-commercial use. And I'll demonstrate that real quick. So a few design concerns. Um, so we're working, again, we want people to enter data and we want to get them a result. And they need to know how to enter the data and how to interpret the result. Um, but beyond that, they, you know, um, the way things are in the modern world, we all have enormously short attention spans. Um, and so we want to do that end-to-end um, -end process very quickly and intuitively. Um, and, and when we're designing anything, and in a website in this case, um, we really want to uh, orient the user to the interface. And there's four, um, four things uh, that I tried to do here. So um, just in particular, every, um, every object that you see on the website has a clear function. Uh, we don't want ambiguity, and we want it to be uh, interactive and easy to use. Um, and not everything you do on a website needs a button or a drop down or an amazing animation. Um, but it needs to be intuitive and work uh, within the flow of how you think or how you hope uh, users are using the website. And I'll kind of talk about that too a little bit more. Um, when uh, possible, I think a graphical representation is, is more helpful than a lengthy textual explanation. Um, yeah, and you know this is the same for like a PowerPoint presentation, for example. If you get a big blob of text or a paragraph or three, um, it's, it takes time and to read that, and you're not necessarily going to spend the time if you're if you're in a rush. Um, whereas a picture is pretty informative if it's done right. Um, and the last thing is uh, what's called object constancy. So if if you're using a website or um, software and you have an object, maybe it's a picture or a text or something, and it suddenly disappears or it suddenly changes form. That's pretty disorienting, and you don't quite know um, what to think of that. And it, it really makes it difficult for the users to, to understand that. So when uh, building this, I tried to keep the objects, make it very clear what user interactions are, uh, are affecting it and how they're doing that, and try to avoid having things disappear and move all of a sudden. So. And real quick before I demo it, um, a brief word on animations, which really get a terrible rap in some places if they're used poorly. Um, but there's, there's a great um, article by uh, Jeffrey here, who's now at UW, actually. He's a professor in computer science. And George Robertson, who's at Microsoft Research. Um, and I've uh, read, read this a few times over the past few years. But um, they have four really good observations and um, a persuasive argument for using animations in websites. So um, motion is pretty effective at attracting attention, right? And it's easily perceived in peripheral vision. Um, animation facilitates object constancy, which I talked about. So things don't disappear and reappear suddenly, and it's hard to follow. Um, animation gives you a natural way of conveying the transformations of that object. And that's a little um, abstract way of putting it, but I can, I can show you what I mean. Um, third, animated behaviors can give rise to um, per, uh, perceptions of causality and intentionality. So you click on a button and what you expect to happen should probably happen, right? Um, and if it's animated, that makes it a little easier to follow. And fourth, animation can be emotionally engaging, engendering interest uh, or enjoyment. So, um, and I think we all uh, know this, even if it's not spelled out like this, if we can interact, and uh, interact with something that um, 
is it engaging, uh, we're going to be more inclined to use it and understand it. So, um, but there's uh, also, <laughs> you can easily go overboard on animations, um, like anyone who used PowerPoint in the 1990s. Um, <laughs> so uh, is it actually directing a point of interest, or is it distracting? Uh, is it engaging, or is it just chart junk? Uh, is it informing or misleading, and is it clear or overly complicated? So those are um, some things that uh, I try to keep in mind when I do my work. So here's the website, and let's jump into that. So we jump in. I've got some little sample data for my testing in right now. But, um, and we can see uh, we're, we're testing um, our blood work, our CBCs. And um, the first thing we want people to understand is that the data that they put in, which are these fields right here, will immediately be reflected on this. Right, so, um, so how do we do that? Um, so we want people to uh, enter by one or two ways. So, so we can either have them manually enter the data by hand, uh, or they can paste from a spreadsheet. So uh, we draw a little attention to this big box that's going to give them a hint that this is what they need uh, to paste into. And we also want to give some, them some help. So if, if it's kind of unclear what in the world they're pasting, or why they're pasting it, or why they need to do that, um, a template often helps. Uh, and in this case, um, I'll use my own. It's kind of like a baking show. I have the turkey already baked and ready. Um, so yeah, so we have, uh, if you get a CBC or blood work done, you'll, it'll be done on a date. You'll have a white blood cell count. Uh, you'll have perhaps platelets done, and within your white blood cells, you will have neutrophils, bands, lymphocytes, monocytes, and others. So we're going to go ahead and paste this right into the app, and give me just a moment here. Okay, and we'll control and paste. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to clear the sample data first. OK, so we're looking at what's called the absolute neutrophil count. Uh, and these are, um, and this is what Dr. Dale mentioned, uh, is looked at when, when we're um, testing for cyclic neutropenia. Um, and we can also, we've, all, we've entered a few fields, so we can look at other things, like here are our neutrophils, here are our monocytes, platelets, and, and others as well. So, and when I talked about animation, it's hopefully not too distracting, hopefully kind of helpful. And it gives you um, an idea of the relationship in time um, between some of these um, measurements and observations. And, um, and it's fun to look at. <laughs> it's interactive. And people, you know, the way the internet is right now, it's got to be fun, engaging, and intuitive for people to actually use it. Um, and there's no, absolutely no reason we don't have to, um, you know, follow the same ideas in research as well. So, um, right, so we've got our data in, and at this point, um, we've got this nice little button that just says calculate periodicity. So we click that. And um, so here on our red line is, I'm sorry, the x-axis is uh, the number of days, and the y-axis is um, kind of the measure of certainty. For, for what we're looking at. So if we look at um, our graph, and we can read the explanation down here first. Maybe that's helpful. Um, so this is called the lam scargill test. And uh, Dr. Dale and one of his colleagues uh, worked for many years on using this um, within the context of um, giving uh, or more understanding cyclic neutropenia. And we can see um, the, the kind of red line right here represents uh, the level of certainty. I've tried to use um, spark lines, uh, which I think are more intuitive. It's, it's easier to understand the red line right here when it's a picture than actually spelling that out. Um, so we can look and see that uh, at the period of about what we would expect, about 21 days, we've got a peak. And that goes uh, at just about the black line right there, which is um, our, you know, we're 99% uh, very certain that that's statistically significant. And I do get a little nervous um, using phrases like that in front of biostatisticians, but, <laughs> um, but that's what I understand it to be. So, um, OK, so I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm a patient. I've entered my data. I've got my results. Um, 
I maybe understand what I'm looking at, maybe not. Um, but right down here, we're trying to help them um, understand what they're looking at uh, and do it in a graphical way too. So we've got our tiny little diagram, hopefully you can see it, um, that has the red line going over the black, uh, black one right down here. And it says, my results are above um, the uh, 0.01 level of confidence at approximately 21 days. Uh, does my patient have cyclic neutropenia? You can click that and you know, we say, well, um, statistically, there, there appears to be evidence, evidence that they do, right? Or maybe I don't see anything above um, the 0.05 level of confidence. Do I not? Does my patient not have cyclic neutropenia? And, um, you know, and we, <laughs> we don't want to say, well, yes, you do. No, you don't. Um, there are a lot of reasons uh, that we want to avoid that. But um, we, we do say, well, statistically, it doesn't appear so. But if you give us more data, if you give the app more data, um, maybe that answer would change. 